Good morning, everyone. So I think we're almost ready. And it's actually very nice uh, to see so many people here. So thank you for joining the first session of the day. It seems like the parties were actually not that crazy last night. I have the people here. So um, welcome again. My name is Tomasz Malishko. I work at HB Rivas. I'm leading the digital workplace platform called Symbiosi. And I'm, my name is Michal Matlon, and I work with user experience and psychology of architecture. So welcome, we are here today to talk about actually boosting employee experience through smart design and technologies. Um, and we have been two years ago asked by our CEO a question. We are a real estate company, we do a lot of projects, we are big enough, but we want to build a new headquarter office. And how do we create a space that will for the future be a kind of showcase of what's out there, the best possibilities for creating the best employee experience using technologies but also smart design. And we have a question for you. Whose company or whose client is going to move, relocate within the next year or two? Raise your hands. Oh, quite a lot of people. So, especially for you, this presentation might prove to be quite inspirational. So we went out there, uh, we partnered with uh, the best uh, for creating this new experience. So we went and we spoke to, to Gensler, who was the kind of concept architect for us. And we said, okay, we want to create this future-proof office and what is the actual the future of work? <coughs> but we also went and we spoke with organizational psychologists, the Living Core from Vienna. They have been presenting a couple of times here at Living Core. And they have done a kind of a future uh, map of us as an organization, but not where we are today, but where we want to be next. Uh, five years and we are a very complex organization. We are not the biggest one in the world We are 800 people, but very very diverse. We have 40 departments psychologists architects construction people procurement So we do this whole value chain of real estate and it's actually the challenge for these people to kind of collaborate together So that was the main objective for creating the space for us And you probably came here to see what was the result, right? so what we did in the end after all this analysis, going through the data, creating a strategy for this space, was a seven and a half thousand square meter office, which included not only the office itself, but also a hub hub co-working where around 250 startupers work, an event space, and a bistro. And today, a lot of people talk about activity-based working. So we know it's important for people to pick and be able to pick where they work, when they work, what they do, what activity, and what space. And so we put over 25 different types of spaces into this office, such as a music room, project islands, playroom, but also many others. And also on the technological side, because today we are going to, as you can see, present together. Uh, and we will show you what is in the space, what we did from the side of technologies, that's Tomasz, and from the side of a point of view of space, that will be me. And so from the technological side, we are collecting around one and a half million data points a day in the whole space. But it's not just important to collect the data, but also to analyze it well and, and use the data in practice. And this is why we are connecting all this data in one of the most advanced smart building, smart building analytical systems. And we want to show you today how space and technologies connect together in this space to create a great employee experience. And we are going to do that through three main topics. So the first one is well-being, how it all supports us being healthy, not just physically, but also mentally. Meeting habits, so how to support good meetings and people meeting the right way. And also interactions, how a well-designed space with the right technologies can support people interacting in the space. And so let's jump into the first topic, which is well-being. We are aiming for the space, well, we are currently in the process of it being well certified. So a lot of design decisions were shaped by the certification itself. And so the first topic we were solving for was active design. 
So this is why we created a lot of elements in this space which support active design, which is simply said just getting people to move. So as you can see, for example, we have created a special room where people are provided uh, exercises for free. Uh, so whether it's yoga, healthy back training, functional trainings, and people use it quite a lot. Uh, then everyone has high adjustable electric desks. And we also have quite a lot of bikers in the building. So we created amenities for them, such as st bikes, bike storage, lockers, showers, and also different, uh, different exercise tools located throughout the space. So usually when you walk into some department and you see this pull up bar, there would be this printed out Excel sheet where people put their records, like how long did I hang on the bar longest or, or how many uh, is pull ups, right? How many pull ups I did. Uh, but the main feature within the space when it comes to active design is an internal staircase. So even when we talk to clients, a lot of companies get, are getting interested into putting internal staircases into their spaces because it kind of surpasses the barriers that the floors themselves create, not just for interactions, but also for people getting healthier. So we wanted to support this and, and motivate people not to use elevators. And uh, so we created a staircase, which is going through all the three floors of the office or of the different spaces in a way that you can just enter the building and without any door, you can walk straight up the staircase. And even there, there's no door because there's face recognition, which recognizes you and either kind of tells you, okay, you can come in or that you are a guest and you should use the floor below. And then you can walk straight to your office. And uh, we would like to ask you another question. And in fact, we'll, we will ask you six questions during this presentation. And we'll be using Kahoot. Do you know that? Do you know the app? And so the, the three, three people with the high score can win some extremely valuable prices. So it's a space bottle. Uh, and space great solar charger for your phone, okay? So just to kind of spice it up. And so the first question would be about the staircase. But you need to connect first. So please go to kahoot.it. It will be in English, not in Italian, so don't worry. And once you go to the website, enter this number. We hope you don't crash the Wi-Fi because we'll be showing you some live data and we need Wi-Fi for that. Good, you can select, yeah, you, you need to make up your name. It can be a real name, but it can be an ET, you know. Yes, it has nice music too. <laughs> oh, so many people. Okay, 27. Can we do more? 29. 30. Okay, is there someone still logging in? Is everyone done? Okay, so we can start with the first question. And the question is, With 300 people in the office daily, how many times is the staircase used? Okay, so there's 300 people in the office during the day. How many times the staircase is used? And we know this by having the face recognition technology in, which is actually also counted. <clears throat> okay, as you saw, wow, yeah. 580, that's the correct answer, and most of you guessed correctly, actually. So, we were also quite surprised by this, because we thought that well, no one will use a staircase if they can use an elevator, right? But it seems, because this, this staircase was also built based on our own research about how to build a good staircase that people will want to use, that this actually worked. If you build a staircase which is comfortable 
enough for people with no barriers, and so on, people will start using it. Another topic which is very important, of course, and you've heard about that a lot also at this conference, is acoustics. So that was very important. Uh, and so we covered more than 25% of all walls with acoustic materials, whether this one or acoustic wood. And we also did what is an acoustic open ceiling. So usually in the offices with open ceilings, with all, all the hipster offices, you know, with the, where you can see the concrete and so on, is not very, uh, is not acoustically not very good. But what we did here is that we actually used an acoustic foam, which absorbs 90% of all sounds, but you can still see the technologies. So we have an open ceiling, but it's acoustic. Another one would be biophilia, a topic that you probably also heard about, uh, which is about bringing nature, but not just nature, literally plants into the spaces, but also many elements which you can find in nature, whether it's natural materials or whether it's kind of some abstract principles such as curved corners. And so you can see here that apart from all of these things like plants, natural materials, curved corners, uh, we have also created an outside terrace with a natural view, which is which became very popular. Well, now it's what is it? Isn't it's not November? It's September. Yes. So uh, so it's kind of, of course slowly getting to this, uh, less and less. But during the summer, it was full of people. Yeah. And then. Also, distractions are another topic which you've probably also heard about in a lot of these presentations at this conference. So we know that distractions are not only bad for productivity, but also for well-being because they, they make you more stressed. And so we created 19 of these focus spaces uh, along with a library, which many people can use at the same time, but it's a quiet space. So even if your boss comes and, and they want to fire you. They cannot do that in the library. <laughs> and we are also, we have partnered with Steelcase uh, for a research about focus spaces. So we have uh, three of these experimental focus spaces within our office and we are measuring how people use them, whether uh, through occupancy sensors, noise sensors, and also people's ratings. Perfect, so um, now we're gonna look at actually some live data. So I'm gonna be connecting to our office and I would like to show you a couple of the digital capabilities and products that people can actually use. And we didn't actually wanna create a building, a smart building just for the sake of having the data and the sensors. We went out and actually we talked to people and said, what kind of things would make sense for you? What would make your day in the office a better experience? So the first product I would like to show you, our first uh, technology that people have the access to in the office as a digital twin. Okay, so this is a live digital twin of our office and it's available in an app so people can interact with it in an app, but also we have these totems like you would find in a shopping mall so that you can come to it. And let's put ourselves in our shoes of someone who is actually new to the company and uh, the first day and it's a very you know complex space. It's located on three floors, 7,500 square meters. So the person can actually come to it and explore it. Actually, it's done in a computer game engine Unity. Some you might know it, you can actually, this is the engine that you would use for some of the computer games out there. So we wanted to make it really nice and interactive. So let's say you come to uh, the Totem and you're looking for different departments. As I mentioned, we have uh, quite a complex organization. So you're looking for the construction department or the finance. So it's just a very simple way for you to get to know the space. Also, as Michal mentioned, we have a lot of these points of interest, so different space types, so you can actually click on it and get to know, okay, there is a music room, what is the functionality of that? But then we come to something you know, more advanced when we try to educate people about the importance of uh, knowing what is the space quality around you. So we have IoT sensors throughout the space, which are monitoring temperature, humidity, and CO2, and you can just click on the temperature here and you see which, warms, which zones are warmer, which are cooler. So you can actually choose to avoid some areas if they are out of your temperature comfort zone. The yellow one is the warmer one and the green ones are the cooler ones. So you see really that although we have this ability to maintain the space uh, temperature, people come, we have these uh, smart uh, tablets, which I'll show you in a second. So some people just change the temperature and then you create different zone types. So still you have the abilities to choose the environment based on your preferences. 
Humidity is very important. Actually, I have to say there was one thing that we didn't think about uh, was the fact that we have so many acoustic materials in the space that in the winter time they soak up a lot of the humidity. So we are actually using 45 uh, degrees of humidity for the whole building and for the other floors where the other tenants are, that's just fine. But for our space, it's not enough because the foams and the acoustic materials, they soak up around 8% of that. So we have to put in additional humidity. And that's one of the things we were able to find out because we have these sensors throughout the whole space. And the same for CO2, very important. So now we're looking at CO2. So whatever is green is fine. We're actually noticing that the CO2 throughout the open areas, these are these boxes here, so these are the kind of areas where people sit, is actually usually very good, so below 800, so excellent for us most of the time. But sometimes in the meeting rooms, like we can see here, this meeting room here, has a potentially certain situation where the CO2 is around 900 ppm. Now, people can know about it from this view here, but also there is a tablet in the meeting room, and they get a notification that something is happening in that space. So when I go and we can check the more detailed information view, so the facilities management would have this kind of instant overview of what's happening in the space, so they can actually identify. Actually, the room we were looking at with this uh, orangey color, that was the meeting room number nine. So that's the first one, and the CO2 there is 1,156 ppm. But basically, we have the capabilities to boost more air into spaces where it's needed at the moment. But probably what's happening there is that people are overusing that space. So they brought more chairs in there than the space was designed for. And actually, this is happening throughout many of the meeting rooms around the world, just people don't know. So for us, it's very important to notify people about that situation. And as I mentioned, in each of the rooms, we have a tablet. So we're now looking at meeting room number five. So this is a live reflection of that meeting room. Um, and we have the uh, capabilities in that tablet to integrate a lot of the use cases. So this is a second product. We call it Space Experience Tool. And we integrate it on top of a uh, standard building management system, which we have in the space, uh, smart functionality, which we thought will make people's lives better. So the first integration is with um, uh, booking system. So here our colleague uh, Dani Sashi has a meeting there and we can extend the meeting by I think 15 or 30 minutes goes directly to Outlook. For more than 30 minute bookings we still want people to use the exchange so the Outlook where they can actually configure the setup of the meeting room itself. Um, also you can choose your scene, you can change the light, uh, shading, and temperature based on your preferences. Uh, but also you get a notification here in the top right corner not to open the window because the humidity outside is just too high and the system would not be efficient. Uh, what we can actually check is the responsiveness of the system. So let me, we have a camera there, it's our demo room, so we're not uh, doing anything illegal there. People know that we can actually look at them. So let's put down the shades. Let me quickly change this here. Bang go straight down. So the system is very responsive, very quick. And, we and have this, is, this is thousand kilometers away. Yeah, yeah. and the Wi-Fi connectivity. So we were <coughs> very happy for the system to be very quick and very responsive. Um, looking at other functionalities that we have integrated in the system itself. So uh, there is the information about the air quality here. So let me just put this up here. Okay. So, Temperature, CO2, we're notifying people why it's important, so they can click on the CO2 levels here. And as you can see, there are certain peaks, so the CO2 is going up when there is a large meeting in that space, but also air supply is going up. So automatically the system is trying to help you. Once the CO2 goes past 800 ppms, the system is actually taking air from where it doesn't need it and putting it where it's needed. Also, the next level for us will be based on the fact that the building knows that there are certain meetings happening at certain times, it will pre-boost the meeting room with the maximum amount of air just because it knows there's going to be a large meeting happening in that space. And also there is a capability for us to use additional services so you can report an issue depending on what type of issue it is, it goes either to IT or office uh, experience team. But we have this super fancy functionality that people just love. We have a barista, so people can actually <laughs> order a lacto-free espresso and it goes directly to the barista and you are served the coffee into the space. 
We have another question for you. First, you'll be able to see what are the results after the first question. So these are first three places, but still others have a lot of chances to go higher. So how much of working time are CO2 levels at these excellent levels? So it's 25% of time, 70% of time, 87 or 98% of time. In the open areas, how well is the system keeping up? So the correct answer is 87% time. We would love to be at 98. Thank you for the trust in our system. <laughs> but we're still, we're there in um, not even a year. So we're commissioning so the system. Uh, you need at least two cycles, so summer and winter time, to be able to uh, set up the system properly. So hopefully, uh, next time uh, we can present, we'll be up at the 98%. And as Tomasz also said, it's a lot about change management. So che teaching people to actually use the spaces correctly, work with them to not meet, to not have a five-person meeting in a three-person meeting room because the air system is designed only for those three people, right? So. A lot of companies today talk about meetings. Some of them want to get rid of them as much as possible, but we have a lot of meetings. We like to meet or we need to meet. And so we designed the space to actually support productive meetings well. And we did that also based on the research that Tomasz mentioned at the beginning that we've been doing before designing the space. And one of the, one of the things we did is to measure the size and the frequency of the meetings and what meeting rooms they are happening in, in the, in the previous office. So we would be able to know how many and how large meeting rooms to put in the new space. What a lot of companies do is that they, they just think about it, right? And they put, let's say, three huge meeting rooms into the space. And then what you can see in reality is that the occupancy is by three-person meetings, two-person meetings, or just people will work there alone because they need to focus and so they are taking up a huge space. So we wanted to make it as effective and as efficient as possible. And this is also what the next question is about. So this is kind of a question time with higher question density. And it will be exactly about these meetings. So let's see what was, okay. So what size of meetings was most common when measuring in the previous office? So was it two person meetings was the most common, three person meetings, four to six, or six to 10 person meetings? You're answering quite quickly. <coughs> They're very productive. Oh, so there was a lot of different guesses this time. And the correct answer is indeed one-on-one -on -one meetings. And, but we'll also in the presentation see what was the exact category distribution. So 11 plus meetings, that wasn't even an option because luckily that was just 1% of the time, you know, that these huge meetings, they can be like really inefficient. And it's, it's even difficult to design a meeting room for that. Six to 10 person meetings, taking up 15% of times, time. Uh, four to five person meetings, 20%, so it's growing. Three person meetings, 21% of time. And one-on-one -on -one meetings, who wants to kill me? 43% of time. So if you put together one-on-one -on -one meetings and three people meetings, you get 64% of all meetings. So what we did in the space is that we created a lot of meeting spaces, which are not for large amount of people, but we put a lot of these small two, three person meeting rooms throughout the space. So now you can re really use the space efficiently. Good, so we're gonna look at next use case and that's helping people to actually find meeting rooms. Uh, the research says people waste on average on a weekly basis 50 to 60 minutes by not being able to find a meeting room, a desk uh, or a colleague. So in our 
virtual office here. Uh, we integrated the data from the booking system, so when I click on meetings here, you can actually see spot on which of the meeting rooms are available for you uh, to book. So the green ones are available, so you can just click on a meeting room, it says it's free for you to book, and also shows you um, the current status of the environment. So CO2 levels, temperature, and all these things. The next version we're going to roll out is going to be love your assistant. So you just come to the system, say, hey, I need a meeting room for four people for two hours. I need a flip chart right to the wall. I need a lot of air and light, and it will just recommend you the most suitable space closest to you. So that's going to be uh, taking it even a step further. Also, we have these um, hot desks. So if I mentioned that people are looking for uh, desk availability, so this is our quiet zone. There are desks underneath the table, so people can actually come uh, to the system and see, okay, there is a desk. Uh, for some companies, there can be a functionality. You click on the desk, and it will book it for you for 15 to 30 minutes. So when you're approaching the office, you, doesn't have, you don't have the stress of not being able to know where to sit. And we can actually even, uh, based on indoor positioning data, which I'll show in a couple of minutes, tell you where is the highest probability for you to find colleagues uh, from your department in that area. And here, actually, even if, it, even if you go to a toilet during focusing, uh, you can still see that the, there was a green, yellow, and red option. So, so even after, I think it's up to five minutes, it turns yellow. So still people know maybe not to take your desk if you just went away for a while. Um, another functionality, again, we're looking at live data from our headquarter office, is kind of the dashboard that people have in the lobby. So this is our 10 meeting rooms in our external area. Whatever is green, it means there is no one in that space. Whatever is orange, there are meetings at the moment happening. Uh, and we're also counting the number of people. It's anonymous counting with technology coin point grab. It's, uh, it's up in the ceiling of the meeting room. So this number here shows that the meeting room is designed for six people. That's uh, after the slash. But there are seven people there at the moment. In meeting room F, it's a lonely meeting. There is one person at the moment, uh, probably on a Skype call. Uh, but also, you see the small symbol here. This means that the meeting room was booked and it's used, uh, but meeting room E was booked. People didn't show up, so there is no one there, although it was booked. Now we have the capability after a couple minutes to debook that room. So when we talk to our clients, it's not just the case that many times you don't have enough meeting rooms, you're just not using them efficiently enough. And we'll also like to ask you a question about these no-show meetings. Um, maybe just coming back to your numbers, let me see. Uh, but to confirm, yes, so this is actually, so the d data Michal showed you was from our assessment before we moved. And this data here is actually by understanding how people are actually meeting based on the indoor positioning technology. Sorry for uh, the size is not too big, but to confirm the fact that actually uh, sizes of groups, mm -hmm. yes, so we're still three to four. Uh, including the smaller meetings, we are at, is that 92%? Uh, so that's confirming the fact this is actually the actual data from how we use the space. Uh, but coming to the point you mentioned about these uh, large meetings, so we were lucky we're not, to have, not to have them, but the lengths of interaction, we're actually noticing that 11% uh, of our meetings are four hours and more. So although you know that this can be for the fact that we have these large design review meetings and they take, take a lot of time, but still we, we work with the organization to help some departments to cut away these long meetings because they can be really unproductive. So let's ask a question which regards to the to the no-show meetings. And we would like to ask you how many percent of these meetings are no-show meetings. So what is the number, the percentage of meetings where no one comes? Is it 14, 30 percent, 55, or 2 percent? So no one was that optimistic. Some people are very pessimistic, but the truth is somewhere in the middle. So it's 14% of meetings where people don't show up. And this is where also technology can help us because if we detect that there's no one uh, in the meeting room, let's say five, 10, 15 minutes, then we can set up the system to free the meeting room up, right? 
And the third topic, as we said at the beginning, is interactions. So well-designed space can support interactions. And so why would we want people to interact? Well, of course, to socialize, to create relationships, to exchange ideas, because if a lawyer meets with a designer, sometimes the multidisciplinarity of the situation can help us solve some problems. And so problem solving is, uh, is the next reason. In the old office, we were very divided, and this is not good for the interactions. So we were not only divided into three different floors, but technically <coughs> into two different buildings, although the lobby was kind of in the middle, so it was connecting it all. People working here, they were behind, imagine such a, such a wooden wall, there's a door, the door is also wooden, so you cannot really see it, and there, but there was a whole design department behind the door, and so we called it Narnia, so no, no one, no one uh, went there. <laughs> so in the new office, although as we saw the whole space is on three floors with the bistro and the co-working and the event space, our whole office for around 400 to 450 people is on a single floor which goes around the building. So there is no vertical barrier between people. So that's one important thing. And we have another question for you. And it's more knowledge-based. So there's a certain distance in meters after which research shows that people's interactions fall dramatically. So if you have a desk, if you work some distance away from someone, it's much less probable that you are going to have uh, good interactions. And the distance can be either 20, 50, 70, or 100 meters. Maybe some of you already know about this. And the correct answer was 50 meters. This is called an Allen curve. You can read up on that. Uh, and this was, this was done, I think, at MIT, where they measured the engineers, how they collaborate. Uh, and although this is an older study, what is interesting, there, they, there were newer studies done, which found that this not only applies to face-to-face -face interactions, but also to email and other digital interaction. So it's really important, and that's what also we do, what we did for ourselves, what we did do with others, is to really think about what departments need to collaborate and putting them in the right neighborhoods together. You can fix a lot of, uh, a lot of problems with collaboration this way. Also, in the old office that you, see, you, you saw bef before, people were using these small, not very pleasant, kitchenettes which were located near to their department. So some people just came to work, they started working, and they wanted a coffee, so they just went across the, across the corridor to the nearest kitchenette, they made their coffee, they went back to the office, they met no one, or just a few people that were already working nearby. But what we did in the new space was to centralize this function, to put it really in the middle of everything. We created this large social zone where it's actually the only two coffee machines on the whole floor where 450 people are here. As you will see, there are also other options on other floors, but for this floor, really, if you want coffee, if you want to, to make yourself a lunch, you have to come here, you have to meet people. And at least personally, for me, it was quite efficient uh, in, in supporting meeting new people because I have, many, uh, I have met many new colleagues there, which I have not met for two years before in the new office. And so it looks like this. This is one of the kind of main dining spaces, uh, which is very popular, especially when there's food, which we do once a month. It's actually bring and share. So the company doesn't support it. People uh, bring all of this stuff, they make it at home, which is actually really super small way to boost engagement and people are just very passionate to show their best recipes. Yeah, so we're always guessing who's going to bring what and you know what's the minimal amount I have to bring in order to eat most of the food other people bring. <laughs> but on the floor below, 
there's this kind of guest area, visitor area with visitor, visitor meeting rooms, uh, where you will also find a barista operated by, by a local hipster brand. Uh, so, so we are providing free coffee to both employees and guests. And it's not just your ordinary espresso, but as Thomas showed in the meeting room controls, you can have anything lactose free, lactose full, half and half lactose free, lactose full. <laughs> Cappuccino, uh, maybe not Frappuccino, but sometimes they had ice cream, I think, or hot chocolate in the winter, right? That's very nice. And so this area is also kind of designed as an informal meeting space, as a cafe. And then there's the mansion terrace, which is interesting not, also, not only because it's outside and it's nice, but also be, be, because it allows for interactions not just between people from our company, but also with the startups that live kind of across. So we can enter from HP Revis, but you can also enter from the co-working. And so this is a nice way of connecting uh, kind of the corporate side of things, corporate people and startup people. And connected with the bistro, which, which is actually available for the public. We also have this kind of public connection through, through the events, uh, but also through ordinary food, which is very important for innovation to connect a lot of different groups of people, different types of organizations. <coughs> and also for interactions, for these spontaneous interactions, not only to happen in the corridors, but also to make sense, uh, you need to provide spaces which allow them to continue. So this is a corridor and people walk here. If I bump into Tomasz on this corridor and uh, I wanted to say he owes me money, but that's not very business-like. So let's say we want to have a meeting. I wanted to discuss something with him. Uh, so we meet on the corridor, but we cannot continue the conversation on the corridor because people will be bumping into us and so on. So we have these, these meet, meeting booths where we can kind of immediately go to. So this is very important when thinking about designing for these spontaneous interactions, not only for them to happen in the first place, but to have another place close by when they where, where they can uh, continue and if that was a closed meeting room that wouldn't be as good for that because there's uh, immediately this barrier that prevents this good so let's have a look on how we can actually support interactions using technology um, a bit of context so we as a company transformed over the last four years we went from a large real estate developer doing the hardware the buildings the square meters to becoming a workspace solution provider so a lot of new services for us like the co-working workspace advisory smart building technologies so we actually need to understand how to be a very fluid organization and maybe it's the case for many of you that your strategy cycle in your company is not five years anymore it can be two years one year so we want to be actually relevant with us as an organization but also with the space itself so what we did, we uh, incorporated indoor positioning system throughout the whole space, the most accurate we could find on the market, so the accuracy is 0.8 meters. This technology is coming from a company called Kupa in Finland. It's very uh, precise, they're actually able to monitor the uh, hockey pucks in the Finnish league. Uh, so the accuracy was super important for us. All the people have a badge, a badge like this, uh, and in this badge there is an active triangulating chip which sends out the location. Uh, of course, this is all GDPR compliant. As long as you have at least five people in the department, you can actually know who the person is. So we're not collecting the data on the individual level unless the person gives us the consent and um, gets a lot of benefits in return. So let's have a look on how actually the data flows in. So, um, yeah. You see the badges moving around, so there's a badge, a person going around. And this is just to demonstrate the accuracy of the system. So the accuracy is 0.8 meters, the lag of time of data flowing in is 1 to 2 seconds. And actually this accuracy is super important for us for several reasons, and that's to understand how people use the space. And on a long-term basis, all this data goes to Data Lake, so we can predict the behavior of the building on certain days, on certain patterns. Uh, actually, it works for bigger offices, but let me jump here into our UK office. So it's a smaller office, uh, it's 1,000 square meters, located at 33 Central, um, beautiful building in central London. Uh, so let's see if there's more activity there. It's 8.40 in, in London, so usually we see at least 50, 60 badges moving in, but uh, 
it seems like there's not a lot of people yet in the office. So it allows you to do a lot of things. So health and safety in case of you need to evacuate the building, you know where people are, but also gives you the ability to have functionality like find a colleague. So this is super useful when you want to be located, you can also opt out of the system anytime. We're actually no noticing for our case, 93% of people subscribe to the system because it allows <coughs> us then to give them understanding of how they use their space. So it becomes their assistant. There is a lot of um, insight we can provide them, whether they're not spending too much time in meeting rooms with high CO2, or also how they interact with other departments. So let's have a look at that, because that's actually super important for us to understand how people use the space. Uh, but coming back to what we can do with the data, uh, before we touch upon interactions, it allows us to understand how people use the space. So you see different patterns of space usage throughout the days. So we can see um, our space is the busiest at Mondays and Tuesdays. And if I click on the common area here, this is the dining room that Michal showed. It's most active on Mondays, Tuesdays, and then it kind of fades down a little bit for the rest of the week. And the reason we notice this, that people on Sundays tend to cook their dish and bring it, bring it in to the office on Mondays and Tuesdays. And actually what we noticed, if people know on Sunday that it's gonna rain on Monday and Tuesday, they cook even more so that they don't have to leave the building to get their lunch outside. So that's the information for the facilities manager to bring in more chairs on those days. And then on Thursday, Friday, where the occupancy drops down, we can do like things like people can show their uh, videos from their travel experiences so we can transform that area and work based on the data collected. Um, also, we're able to analyze work styles. So here are two examples of departments that are completely different from way of working, uh, two extremes, so accountants, and this is uh, showing that they're spending 90% of their time at their desk. So the ergonomy of their space is super, super critical. Compared to senior manager, main managers, these guys are actually moving, using the whole space, talking to different departments, aligning. So 42% of their time, that's five to six hours per day in meeting rooms. So for those people, super important to know where are those meeting rooms, how to book the best one, but also what is the CO2, because if they spend two to three hours in high CO2 environment, they're guaranteed to go home with a headache. So they are actually very aware of that fact because we're working with them, we're educating them, and with people that are spending a lot of time at their desks, they have a therapist coming in every two, three months, helping them to adjust their environment for most productive work. And we're a very complex organization, so there's a lot of the 25 departments that we have. So you as a space manager, but also team manager, you can actually look at the profile of how you use the space for different departments and then see if you need different space types or actually educate your people to use spaces in a different way. And coming to the education, um, so we previously worked as a quite siloed organization. We're doing buildings around Europe and we need people to talk to each other to make these buildings happen. And previously, departments that need to be there, the ingredients for cooking the dish, as we call them sometimes, so that's, they, they were siloed. So the development managers sitting together, the product design managers sitting together, and they would have one or two alignment meetings per week, long meetings. And we said, that's not gonna work. So we created these project islands, and this is where the most relevant people are actually sitting full time, and the other people that need to align with them come and have interactions, the stand-up meetings, the agile way. So here for this project, they are happening before uh, 10 o'clock and then after lunch, and also they're aligning actually uh, in the afternoon. So uh, you can also see how many people come to that project at certain space, a certain time, and compared to the other project here that I clicked on, uh, it's a different pattern. So these people like to work together more kind of uh, ongoing basis. They don't have these kind of spikes in alignment but also have a different composition. So that's something super important for us to understand how people use the space. And when we come to something <laughs> most complex for us as an organization is understanding actually how people communicate. So this is kind of a neural map of us as an organization with our 25 plus departments, and it shows actually who is talking to who, okay? This is based on the proximity of two badges in meeting rooms. So that's kind of the meeting hours of two departments with each other. We also have the capability to link the data to uh, workplace analytics by Microsoft. So then you have both the physical and the digital view. 
And this is what we think is the most important thing for us in order to navigate the organization. Because when we see a drop in Teams interactions, then we can act upon it. And actually all this is available to everyone. So the CEO of the company cannot see anything more than an employee or a team leader. We want this data to be out, to be transparent, because there is nothing wrong than assumption on communication. If it's communication is bad, it's bad, but if the assumptions about the communications don't work, that's even worse. And an example for us, if I may kind of uh, show things from our own kitchen, is that I'm pointing now to procurement department, which is the largest department in the company. As you can see, the proportion of the sizes of their meetings are actually quite small. So it means like they are quite inter, in intra kind of link. They talk to each other mainly, but also they have a very limited ties to the board of directors, which is here, and senior management. And that was for a reason that uh, their leader left the company two months ago, and they were kind of, let's say, stranded uh, with the communication although they are very important for us to create best products. Uh, so we were able to identify that lack and uh, slowly, this, this tie was there not two weeks ago, so we see now that they are starting to communicate at least with the other senior managers on aligning that. So uh, we would love organizations to harvest that kind of data in any form uh, they can collect it using any form of technology and also then think about how space can support those interactions. And we also have a last question for you, which is the last chance to move up the ladder. Very important. So these are now the first three positions. And the next question is about the senior managers. So within the meeting spaces where we measure that, how many interactions with, with, with people do the senior managers have on average? One senior manager, right? Yes, in a month. How many people? Okay, and the correct answer is 320. So during the month, this person, a single person, has to meet, have over 320 interactions, and that's just in the meeting spaces. So they probably have to have the environment really, really well suited to this. Good, I think we are towards the end of our presentation. So we would like to leave you with the thought of um, how can you actually use uh, smart space and smart design and technology to help your organizations to become ready for the future. Uh, so we're gonna be sticking around here for a couple minutes even after the presentation, but actually we are good on time. So I think we can- We can tell some, some jokes. Okay. Take some of your questions.